there, Alaskans, wherever you are. Welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right in a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. Well, welcome everybody to the Must Read Alaska show. I'm your host, John Quick, coming to you live from somewhere in Alaska. We want to thank everybody for tuning in today. And uh, we want to remind folks, if you like our uh, podcast, to give us a five-star review. We're on iTunes, Spotify, our Heart Radio. Uh, the list goes on. And, uh, you know, we offer our content for folks for free. And so the only thing we ask in return is if you like it, click a five star on iTunes. You don't even have to leave any words on the review. You can literally just click the five star. Mm -hmm. And if you have a smartphone, you can go to the app store on your um, Android phone or your Apple phone and just type in Must Read Alaska and our app pops right up. Uh, we have a custom app just to you for you and free for use. Uh, and so if you like our app and you use it already, feel free to pop us in a five star review as well. And uh, without further ado, I want to welcome our guest to the program, Les Guerra, who's running for governor. He's the Democrat on the ticket. And uh, in this new ranked choice voting world, this will be very interesting. And so welcome to the Must Read Alaska show, Les. How are you doing, John? Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Well, I appreciate you joining us. I think it's important for, um, you know, we have a fairly conservative show, but I think it's important for for folks to hear directly from every side. And so I, I really do appreciate you joining us on the show. So my first question to you this is this, Les, where did you grow up and, and what first got you involved in politics? Yeah, it's a long gap. So um, I was, uh, my father and mother were immigrants and I was born in New York. Um, and, uh, you know, my story, some know it, some don't, but um, parents didn't get along. Uh, father got custody of me when I was six. And uh, uh, he had an office in Harlem where neighborhood he loved and people loved him there. Um, and uh, late one night, though, somebody came in uh, and, and killed him uh, when oh, I was wow. six. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I don't I don't want any sympathy. I, 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 I've had a good life. I've got a great wife. Everything is good for me. But um, and I think it developed my view. I grew up in foster care. So starting at six uh, till graduating high school I lived in foster care and um, and it sort of developed my view that everybody deserves a fair chance in this world whether you're born rich or poor um, whether you've got a troubled family or a great family uh, you deserve a fair chance to succeed in this world it means a good education it means job training or college whichever route you want to take if you want it and I think if you can't afford it um, I don't think money should be a barrier to you I think uh, you know you deserve job training you deserve to be able to get a skill, whether it's college or job training. And, and I believe in financial aid to help people through loans, uh, 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 financial aid. If you don't have the money, um, I don't think money should be a barrier to success is my view. So what was that first, uh, you know, put your toe in the pond to get involved in politics? Did you, did you jump on a community board? What was that first thing that you got? It was like the last straw of like, I got to put my name in the hat here. If this thing's going to get fixed. <laughs> Uh, it was it wasn't anything ever really planned. So I, I first ran in 2002 for the legislature, served there, um, and it was a uh, it was a gerrymander. You know, I mean, look, the Republicans and Democrats both gerrymander. They just like, let's just face it. I've tried to stop that in, that in the legislature by doing nonpartisan redistricting, but there was a gerrymander that year. It was a Democratic gerrymander, and and all of a sudden I was living in a district that had no representative. Um, they drew a line to I don't know what they were trying to do to other people, but. So that was the first day I ever thought about it. It was like one, I was between jobs. I uh, I just left a law firm. Um, uh, you know, I've served as an assistant attorney general. I did the civil prosecution uh, with a team uh, after the Exxon Valdez oil spill against Exxon. And then I was an attorney for oil. I haven't practiced since 2000. But um, but I thought, you know, I'd rather, I think I'd rather do this. So it was, uh, it was just, you know, the... I thought about it just when this uh, this district opened up, and I thought that's a way to try and make the world a better place, and, and so I ran. Nice. So let's talk a little bit about the Alaska economy. You know where I live out here in Nikiski, uh, a two by four is like you know eighteen bucks. Do you think the Alaska economy is doing well? And um, if yes, how so? And if you don't think it's doing well, what are some things that you would try to fix if if uh, you get in there as governor? 
I don't think it's doing well, right? I mean, and in part because this has been an out-migration state um, all through this governor's term uh, for a long time. Um, at some point, you tear apart the state enough, people see, don't, see, uh, don't feel any confidence in public education, don't want to raise their kids here. They don't see a construction budget. Our construction budget has been sort of an austerity construction budget uh, for construction jobs, electrician jobs, laborer jobs, architect, engineer, all the jobs that come out of the construction and community project budget. And so people have been leaving. And that's that's why we have a job shortage here is, is so many professionals have left. And, and uh, you know, I think that takes away opportunity for people. Um, so I believe in uh, a construction budget, a community project budget. I believe in education. And, uh, and I think we've got to build the state back up again so people have opportunity. So when you say construction budget, community uh, opportunity budget, um, are you speaking specifically about ramping up some of those capital projects that maybe we've shelved for the last five to 10 years? Yeah, I mean, this people could be working, should have been working these last 10 years. Look, we're going to have a lot of federal money that comes in. That's going to change things a little bit. Um, you're not going to need as much state money because of all the federal money that comes in. But um but for the last decade, I've said we should have a, what they call it the capital budget. And, you know, it funds like uh, harbor expansion in, or, or repairs in, in Kenai or Homer. Um, it funds road construction. It funds airports. It funds we've got two billion dollars of uh, sort of decaying buildings and infrastructure between the state and university of what they call the deferred maintenance list. It's barely been touched for a decade. And, yeah. and those are those are things you should be doing and they put people to work. And so I think you have this combination of people don't see, uh, don't feel any confidence in the public education system they're leaving. They saw those jobs disappear, you know, according to the university, like by cutting the construction budget from what was an average of about $500 million a year to about $100 million a year. Um, this year was a little higher with, with high oil prices, but um, but that cost about 4,000 jobs. People have left the state. And, uh, you know, everybody here knows somebody who's thinking about leaving the state who's left the state. That's that's not the state I want to live in. I want to I want a state that, that, you know, from my background, growing up in foster care, um, my background tells me that people should have the chance to succeed in life. And that means those jobs that we haven't had. So the hot button topic, you know, over the last five years seems to be the permanent fund. Um, I think you have usually two different buckets of folks, sometimes three. One is the, you know, full permanent fund. One is um, uh, they're fine with the government kind of taking their share and then they get a little bit. And then one, I guess the other bucket is let's just get go away with it. Maybe do like a payout or something like that. So we just stop having this conversation. What's your stance on the permanent fund and uh, kind of give us, give us the uh, rundown on where you stand on it. I think you can have a bigger permanent fund. I think at least $2,200 over growing every year. Um, you know, the governor shifted between the statutory to then he's on a 50% dividend. I don't know what his latest plan is, but in truth, uh, he averaged a $1,230 dividend his first three years. Um, in truth, when Governor Walker vetoed the dividend in 2016, he he voted to uphold it, not to override it. I, I, I tried to come in and override it because I said this is just going to cause a fight over the permanent fund for the next decade. So I don't think the governor's, a, you know, I think he says he's a supporter of the dividend. I don't think he's been a supporter of the dividend. And I think the big problem right now in this state is you're told you either get a dividend or you get schools or you get a construction budget and put people to work or you get um, a, a, a renewable energy projects. And they're all ors. And, and so everybody's turned against each other. People who want schools are turned against people who want a dividend. They're turned against people on job training in a university and financial aid, uh, which this governor tried to empty the fund that pays that. And I don't think we need to turn people against each other. But I, I think the way you have the money so that we can do all these things and stop turning people against each other is, you know, Jay Hammond, former governor, used to say, first, you get a fair share for your oil. I don't think we're getting a fair share for our oil. We, we give away $1.2 billion in oil company tax credits. Uh, those are largely subsidies. Um, and, and I think we have to, uh, I think we have to take a look at that. And, and we get uh, most of that money back and we can have all those things that just talked about. We don't have to fight with each other. Well, what about, uh, you know, statewide in, uh, tax? I, I, you know, my stance is we don't need one, but I think a lot of folks maybe on the Democrat side or nonpartisan side could be fine with a sales tax, statewide sales tax, or a very small income tax. Do you think we need a statewide tax? And uh, if so, why? 
I don't think we need a statewide uh, income or sales tax. I don't think so at all. Um, I think we would we'd have a balanced and strong budget if we uh, stopped giving away these subsidies uh, to the oil industry to the wealthiest companies in the world. Um, uh, I think Jay Hammond would have done that. Um, I would want to do that, and and I voted to do that when I was in the legislature. We got uh, we ended we we passed a bill through the house that was a simple 25 percent tax on oil company profits that goes higher at high prices and lower at low prices um and uh that would have been fair to the oil industry fair to us we, we would have had an extra 800 million dollars a year if the senate didn't block it but it passed with republican and democratic votes and independent votes in the house um so uh look i think that i think everybody wants something that costs money whether uh, you want a bigger dividend or you want um, uh, school funding or you want uh, construction project funding and community project funding. Everything costs money. I think people can come together on, 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 on getting a fair share for our oil. And I don't think you need a income tax or sales tax. Well, that's interesting. I, I would happen to agree with you. I don't think we need an income tax or a sale, state sales tax. You know, state, at least where I live on the Kenai Peninsula Borough, we do have a sales tax and it funds our schools. And, um, you know, we have interestingly enough passed a bond package. And when I say we, the school district passed a bond package. I didn't have anything to do with it, but they passed the bond package for the first time. I would say in like 15 years, they passed one because roofs were falling apart and whatnot. And so, you know, even in a conservative area like the Kenai Peninsula, they, they uh, were still able to pass a bond package. So um, I, I think it's a, uh, uh, I think conservatives are worried about a statewide income tax and a statewide sales tax. So that's um, I, I'm happy to hear you say that you don't think that we need one. Let's let's move on to COVID. So yeah, I think can we go, can we go back to just school construction for a second? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the kind of thing that puts people to work, right? I mean, you've got schools that need repair. You've got leaking roofs. You've got buckets inside classrooms, and um, and but the but communities haven't been able to do school maintenance and school construction for a long time because the, what we've had for the history of the state, which is the state chips in 60% of school bond debt to, to help keep property taxes down in lo local communities. Yep. Uh, in 2015, um, frankly, it was, it was mostly Republicans, some Democrats, um, um, and the governor, they, they ended um, school bond debt reimbursement, the state share. They, they said, look, we owe you the money for the past, past school bonds, but we're not going to pay for future ones. I disagreed with that. I mean, I think, you know, if, when, you, when the state stops funding things like that, that's just a pass-through property tax to local communities. Now local communities have to pay everything. Um, and this, then this governor has vetoed uh, money that we owe uh, under the old school bond debt reimbursement statute. I don't, I don't agree with that, I think. We've got a statutory obligation to help communities and, and instead property taxes have gone up because communities have had to foot the bill. But really the biggest thing is we've lost the jobs, the jobs that, and, and, and it's harmed our schools. And, you know, if you do everything on the cheap, at some point jobs disappear. There's nobody to, to be hired to maintain a school or construct a project. And then kids suffer. I just, those are, you know, at some point we're at the point where you're killing jobs and you're killing education. And I think that's what's going on in the state. That's one of the reasons I'm running. Yeah, and you know, sometimes uh, I'm I'm all for being as extremely fiscally conservative as we can be. But I I um you know I toured a school once here on the Kenai Peninsula Borough, and there's there was literally standing water in the school. Um, uh, floors were rotting out, so it's not like at least some of the money on the Kenai Peninsula that we just passed is not going towards building Taj Mahals. It's going towards um, literally fixing roofs that are, you know, pouring out water and uh, floors that are sinking through the bottom. So I think that uh, oftentimes we we forget how long it's been since we've actually, up, you know, upkept some of these schools. We put Band-Aids on them oftentimes instead of um, actually fixing the structural problems that's wrong with them. So I think that at least for the Kenai Peninsula voters, they kind of saw that, oh, crap, some schools do need new roofs. We got floors falling through. You know, this isn't like a safe place in some cases for kids to go learn. So I think that's why ultimately it passed here on the Kenai Peninsula. So let's talk about COVID for a second. I think that, uh, uh, you know, the governor took shots on both sides of the aisle. Um, if Do you think we did too much or too little uh, in terms of COVID mandates? I think we had a mask mandate in the state for, I don't know, three or four weeks early on and then it went away. I know the Juno Capital had a mask mandate. 
Um, do you think the state should have done something different more or less and why? You know, I mean, there's a lot of retrospect you can have, like we know more about it now than we did when it started. Um, and there were times when, uh, you know, 100,000, oh, this huge numbers of people were dying, right? We know more about it now. I think uh, the right thing to do is sort of leave, not to have state mandates. Um, I think you leave that to communities. If there's some community where there's like a huge outbreak and there's some community where everything's fine, I think you do what we've done in this state, which is to leave it to local communities. I personally, you know, I don't, you know, federally, I think they, you associate some federal politicians with vaccine mandates, and I don't believe in any of that stuff. Um, uh, I'm pro-choice all the way, uh, women's right to choose. And if you don't want to get a vaccine, you don't have to get a vaccine, but I, I would recommend it. So I would have done that differently than the governor. I think he didn't hold press conferences after like last November and, um, and he rarely showed up, but I would have shown up or, uh, around the state with p leaders that people trust in local communities, like medical leaders and local leaders that people trust and, and sort of laid out the science that, you know, vaccines probably good for you if, unless you have a health problem that, that makes it dangerous for you. Um, some of the vaccines were better than others, right? It turned out uh, the Johnson and Johnson wasn't, wasn't that great. Um, so I would have, you know, I would have tried to have local leaders give people advice so they can make an informed decision. Um, but not the mandates that people have talked about at the federal level. I think there's a big difference between sort of national Democrats, national Republicans, and, and those of us at the state level. Um, you know, I, I, I'd love to bring some of the national politicians here and show them a, a fishing and hunting state and a state <laughs> yeah. that's much more independent. And, and uh, I don't think most, most, I don't think most Congress people have ever fished or, or done stuff in the outdoors that people here do. I don't think they get Alaska. So I'm, I'm, I'm part of that, uh, that view here, here in Alaska that, that, that the federal politicians just don't get Alaska. They call yeah, us I, a flyover state. I, I, uh, I joke with some of my family members who are um, Democrats in the lower 48 that, you know, we have a different flavor of Democrats up here in Alaska. They own guns and they hunt and fish. <laughs> it's not like the DC folks that your people are used to seeing on TV. So um uh so it's funny what do you think about like you know i don't know if you saw but bethel just did a um they had on their ballot yesterday i believe it was part of that i got the answer <laughs> that's funny so we'll just um we'll move on to the uh, next question maybe the maybe zoom doesn't like that question it keeps kicking oh <laughs> it's it's really quick it's up to the people of bethel right like i said before yeah. those are lo those are local decisions as, as a governor i would respect them and I've, i i want to deal with state issues and that's that's yeah. how do we retain teachers how do we retain police i don't, I don't know if you heard that part but the yeah. the ch chief of police in the city of Kenai can't keep police because a police officer get, gets paid more and gets a pension in, in almost every other state. So they come up here for two years, they hunt, they fish, they have fun, and then they leave and they go to a state where they get benefits and they get better pay. Same thing with teachers. They leave, they come up for a couple of years, they have fun, they leave and they go to another state. The only ones we're able to keep are the ones who are just truly committed to staying in Alaska. But if you're shopping for uh, sort of the best pay and, and the best benefits, we're not even close. So we're, we're, we're non-competitive at this point. So what about gun laws? I think a lot of the national, uh, you know, I hate to loop things into buckets, but I think a lot of the, at least what we're hearing from the national Democrats, you know, in DC and whatnot is we need stricter gun laws or more strict ways for somebody to acquiring guns. The conservative standpoint on that is law abiding citizens are fine following the laws. Folks that are getting guns illegally could care less about your stricter gun laws. They're going to get them regardless. What are your thoughts on stricter gun laws in Alaska and why? Yeah, I think, uh, again, I think uh, there are national Democrats and national Republicans who don't understand that Alaska is a fishing state or a hunting state. Um, and so, um, you know, I think our gun laws here are fine. Um, there, is, there are some Republican states that have, um, uh, you know, a law that says if you're uh, an immediate danger to kill yourself or others. Um, uh, somebody can temporarily sort of uh, withhold your weapon if those are done in the right way, you know, give people due process and and with real evidence that somebody's about to kill somebody. Um, if there's bipartisan support for something like that, that um, that's the kind of thing. That's the only kind of thing I think um, might uh, carry some weight and carry some legs. Uh, and it, it would have to be bipartisan in the state. So, but I don't, I don't, uh, I don't see the national debate uh, being the debate that we have here. Yeah. So what about what, you know, I think, um, you know, I've talked to a lot of folks that are um, kind of debating on whether they're going to vote for you or Walker. I think that that's, there's probably not too many people that are debating if they're going to vote for 
you or Dunleavy or Walker or Dunleavy, they're probably figuring out, okay, do I like less or do I like Walker's camp? So I think my question to you is what separates you from, you know, Walker's standpoint or Walker's camp? What separates your campaign as being different than uh, the other, the alternative choice on the ballot for a lot of folks? Um, yeah, I'll just push back a little bit. I think that I think we're going to get a fair number of Denley voters because I think, you know, a dividend requires that you have the funding for you. You can't do the 1970s liberal thing and say, let here's the here's the how much it's going to cost part. But I don't I don't have a plan on how to fund it part. I have the plan on how to fund it. That's why the governor had a tw- averaged a twelve hundred thirty dollar PFD his first three years. He never proposed a way to fund it. And so Republicans in the legislature said, come to us with a funding plan, but he never had one. It, one of his plans was take $3 billion of extra money out of the permanent fund. And people said, no, I mean, that's, you don't, that would have been the biggest raid in the permanent fund history. So, you know, I, if we end this $1.2 billion in all the company tax credits, we will have money for a stronger dividend than this governor paid his first three years. I agreed with the dividend this year. We had extra oil money and, and the cost of energy is really high. So people deserved energy relief, but the first three years he had no, he had a small dividend and he, he, he up he voted to uphold the the veto dividend in 2016 because he's never really had a plan to pay for it. I'm the only person in this campaign that has a plan to cover the cost of a, a strong dividend and have schools uh, and have financial aid for people who can't afford job training or college, and sort of build back a police force and and pay teachers what we need to to keep them here. So I think I differ from all of the candidates on that. Um, I'm the only person who's come out and said that's what we should be doing. Um, so um, yeah. yeah. Well, I appreciate it. Do you have any last thoughts, Les, before we um, sign off on on this? You know, if somebody is listening and they're interested in, you know, finding more about your campaign or, you know, getting in touch with you or whatever, where do they find you? Are you on what, you know, I'm sure you have a website or Facebook. How does somebody find you? Um, lesgara.com. So L E S G A R A.com. I think the only final thing I'd say is like, I think, um, I think fish bind Alaskans. I fish a ton. Um, and I think, you know, whether you're a commercial sport or subsistence fisherman, I think fish bind people in the state. I, I disagree with governor Denlevy on the pebble mine. He supports it. I think you don't put a toxic nightmare like that at the headwaters of the last great, uh, remaining wild salmon runs in the world. Um, and so I want to make sure we have fish that come back for the next generation. I think I would be better on fish. I think I'd better be better on the dividend. I think I'd be better on schools than any of the other candidates in this race. Well, I appreciate it, Les. Thank you so much for coming on. And uh, you're welcome back anytime. Until next time, I'm John Quick signing off from somewhere in Alaska. And thanks for coming back on two or three times after your phone didn't like what was going on. So I appreciate it, Les. Thank you so much. Thanks, John. See you. Yep. See you.